Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Healing Arts. So I am so excited and I'm about to turn a cartwheel over here because I have one of my favorite guests on the show today, award-winning journalist and amazing thinker for the UFO movement, Linda Moulton Howe is here. Linda, it is a complete honor and a joy to have you on Healing Arts. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I uh, am not a spokesperson for anything. I am a professional journalist and have been since I graduated from Stanford University with a master's degree in communication in 1968. And 68 to 2021, I guess it's about 40, almost 43 full years since I went from uh, being an investigative reporter and a producer of medical series, science series, received a Peabody uh, Award for work that I was doing on medical programming at the ABC station in Boston. And I like to stress this because there's nothing in my life since being at Stanford where I did documentaries with the Stanford Linear Accelerator I did a documentary for the Stanford Medical Center that they used for 19 years and were kind enough to send me a thank you letter at the end of the 19 years of a, a, an experiment that they were doing that my film had documented. And it's always been the same beat for me, science, medicine, and the environment. And that is how in the summer of 1979, as director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver, that there were headlines in the Colorado papers, the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News then. And it said, more animal mutilations or mutilations again. And I had spent a good portion of my life. Uh, my husband worked for a corporation that uh, he had gone to Harvard. So I had done the medical programming in Boston, and mm -hmm. then we had moved to Denver because he was in a new video group. And all of my, uh, my work and everything that I had done had been East Coast, West Coast. Now we're in Denver and this, these headlines about repeating animal mutilations, which I had not heard about on either coast. And so I started, from being a director of special projects by calling law enforcement. And there was a sheriff, Tex Graves, up in Northern Colorado. He had been uh, a sheriff in the county for 23 years, if I could remember, it was 23 or 25. And when I called him, he was just getting ready to retire. And he knew of me because of all the work that I did for television uh, for the CBS station in Denver. And he said, why don't you come up and we'll talk about the animal mutilations. Mm -hmm. And that meeting with Sheriff Tex Graves, who maybe talked to me more straightforwardly because he was retired. But I remember that one of the first things that he did was bring out a box of about 166 or 200 and some color Polaroids that he had personally taken in his work as sheriff from the beginning of around 72 up to when I was there in 79. And uh, I asked him because I like, to, I like to look at timelines. Timelines can tell you everything and they can show you where you should be looking and they can also show you where something you're going off on one path and it may be wrong because once you start studying timelines, it's a whole other skeleton on which to work. And I've always found that. So I asked him if I could look at the uh, Polaroids on the floor, there was a carpet and he said, yes. So I had all of the history that he had recorded. Now on the floor in front of me for the very first time as a TV producer. And I am looking and asking him about some of what I'm looking at. And one was a series of images that showed a black steer with their front legs and back legs so perfectly together 
that the hooves looked like they had been glued. It was actually very artificial looking a situation. And the head was down in a hole. <clears throat> so if you can imagine, <clears throat> it's the smoke from fires. <clears throat> oh gosh, Sorry, yeah. this is happening so much now. We have so much fire smoke pollution. Uh, but so you have the body flat and then you had the head down in a hole. And I asked the sheriff, what um, am I looking at here? And he said, well, that is one of the cases that has caused me to have nightmares. And then what he unfolded was that he and a deputy had gotten a call from the rancher. And as they got out of the truck and they started approaching on dry, dry, there was very little grass and it was very dry. They could see the steer. They could see the unnatural pairing of the hooves and they could see the hole that the head was in. So as they walked to it, Sheriff Tex Graves said, let's go 12 feet around the body and let's take a series of photographs because I don't understand what I'm looking at here. And they took all these photos and when they got close, he said, it hit me, my God, something had the ability to hold this heavy steer flat on the ground with the hooves completely together. There was no signs of any kind of normal struggle, death struggle or struggle with let's say a predator. These uh, front hooves and back hooves were as they were glued together and which is the way the sheriff described it in the Polaroid. And he said, and I took out, I always carry a measurement ruler. And he said, and I put it down in the hole and to the bottom of the hole it was eight inches from the surface where the body was, which is why the head was literally down in a hole with the rest of this body. Mm. And he said, the deputy and I looked at each other and he said, something had the ability to hold this animal in place while it took a surgically excised ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, and rectum. Mm -hmm. And he said, the only thing we could conclude is the head dug the eight inch hole in the agony because it was the only part of the body that was not paralyzed. And I still remember so vividly that this was the moment that it was like going through Alice in Wonderland's mirror for me 40 some years ago, because the cruelty mm -hmm. that was implied in those series of photos was uh, so disturbing. And that is why Sheriff Tex Graves told me it's this case where I started having nightmares. And he said, Linda, I will save you some time. The perpetrators of these bloodless animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. And then he went on with why he was saying it and showed me more photos that are in my first book, An Alien Harvest. And these were photos that either he took or a reporter in Sterling took. They both took photographs of objects that would come in to the night sky above Sterling and Logan County, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And they would do spins like this, leaving when they did, uh, when they did time lapse, you could see all of the spins that all of the people who lived and went out at night, they even started calling it uh, Bertha, uh, uh, Mama Bertha and Bertha. They gave a name to a continuous light that was very bright and would in these uh, time lapses make these circles. And when the sheriff was showing me that, it is hard now in a strange way to remember. I'd never seen anything like this. It all happened that day in, with Sheriff Tex Graves. And it presaged, it anticipated everything that over the next nine months, 18 hour days, 
no breaks. I told my husband, we had a daughter. I said, I'm, I'm getting into something that could be dangerous. I told him that. Mm -hmm. And I said, and if I have to move to an apartment, I will, because I want to see this through. And over the nine months, because I traveled so much with our TV crews, I didn't feel like I was in observational danger at my house in Littleton, Colorado, as much as the crew and I began to wonder, are we being tracked? Are we being covered? And it would be 10 years later that I would have a man come up to me at a conference where I was speaking in around 1989. And he said, I was on the team that was monitoring and tracking you when you were pro producing a strange harvest. I said, what do you mean? He said, you were constantly followed and watched, Linda. Satellites, monitoring. And then adding or paired to that, discovering that 10 years after the work and doing the documentary uh, that when it was broadcast, it was the largest Nielsen and Arbitron audience in the history of KMGH TV for any of its produced programming. And that it was like a bomb went off at the station because back then people forget we only had landline telephones and mail. So if you start having these huge gray bags full of mail start coming in as they did, dragging them into my office and the switchboard operators would say, Linda, we cannot keep up with the phone call. That was the first time that I realized that those nine months of this concentrated, dangerous, spooky work, how many people were writing, not just from the United States and Canada, but from all over the world, sending me illustrations of the craft they had seen over a pasture, or even a being that they had seen in a pasture. Lots about beams coming down into pastures with animals coming down or up in the beams all kinds of correspondence. And I realized I've just scratched, I've just scratched the surface of this iceberg. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to keep going because the bottom line was if other beings that come in these lights that put down beams, that do the spins that people were getting in their time-lapse photos, if it is other creatures from someplace else in the universe, I have to keep going because I've got to find out and why is the government of the United States so silent? By then it was very clear. And tying that moment with the moment with Sheriff Tex Graves in Sterling, when he said, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators are creatures from outer space. I went through Alice in Wonderland's mirror in this way. Mm -hmm. Once you have been in the presence, as I was just in those nine months of probably 12, 15 mutilated animals, they are eerie, and they are strange because there is no blood, but you are looking at a pattern of excisions, a constant and consistent pattern, animal to animal, and a lot with no tracks around them, even on dry, dusty land, which is why I began to see why law enforcement kept saying, somebody, something is lifting these animals up and taking them away and returning them that the surgery is not being done at the location where they were found. And it was the pattern of the ear, the eye, the tongue, jaw flesh, the genitals, if it were female, it could be a half of an udder, a whole udder, or just the teats removed, uh, the 
penis and uh, testicles in the males. It could be part, whole, or just leaving an oval, like you would take a cookie cutter and just go like this and take away the tissue, whether it was a large udder or a male uh, sexual organs, just leaving high, deep uh, excisions. And the lack of blood is what sent me to universities, to uh, pathologists, um, a whole host of people. And later on, one of the most valuable professionals who volunteered came to me to say, I want to help you, was Dr. John Altshuler, hematologist and pathologist. Um, he had his own laboratory in Denver. He was highly skilled, highly respected. And he said, I want to help you because I am the doctor who went down to the San Luis Valley back in 1969 after it was reported in the news that a horse had been found stripped of flesh from the neck up, including mm -hmm. the brain, and nobody knew how or why. So now we're going back to the first official photo and investigation, but there had been others, but I'm just saying it was uh, the end of September or September, I think it was September 9th, 1967. That's the nine, mm -hmm. it was 67. And he, when he, when he first told me this, he said, you know, remember the newspapers are saying that there was this some mysterious doctor from Denver who had shown up and gone to Burl Lewis and said, I would like to see the mutilated uh, horse and wouldn't give their name. And he said, I wouldn't give my name because if I did down there investigating that mutilated horse, I probably would have ruined my career. He was very honest. And what he told me in the 80s about what he had personally seen as a qualified medical doctor who secretly went down to San Luis Valley because of what had been reported in the newspapers, he wanted to see it for himself and said, I couldn't believe it. He said, part of me wanted to report it, but I knew I would destroy my career. He said, I got to the scene with the help of some people that I had approached and said, I want to remain anonymous. I'm a medical doctor from Denver, but I would like to see this animal. And he said, it literally was, it was a curve here. All the flesh on mm. the neck of the horse, the whole skull, every piece of organic soft tissue was gone. And in the photographs, which I have in uh, my first book, An Alien Harvest, you see the rest of the body of the horse looks like it should get up. It looks fresh. There's, the hair is in perfect place, but the whole neck and the head are skeletal. And he said, Dr. Altshuler, who was the secret doctor who, who was talking to me about this all the way into the 80s, he said, I got down on the ground. I got on my hands and knees because I knew that I, I could not start pulling this animal. I, I was not going to be a person who would be tied to, to moving or doing anything. I just wanted to see. And he had a flashlight. He had brought some uh, medical uh, utensils. And what he did was raise this part where the, where the bone started out of the body. He was able to go in and raise up enough for him to get light. And he said, Linda, in my entire medical existence, I had never been prepared for what I was looking inside of that horse in the San Luis Valley. Every single large organ in the chest had been removed. There was no heart. There were no lungs. There was no esophagus. There were, were, were no gallbladder, liver, all of the major organs. It was an empty chamber. And then 
because he, he was a hematologist, pathologist. One of the first things he looked for was pattern of blood spatter. There was no blood. There was no signs of blood. There was no spatter anywhere in the chest. And he said, you tell me, how do you get all of the major organs out of the chest of an adult horse? And there's no signs of any kind of blood stain, clotted blood. I heard that in variations as I began to, uh, I started on my own parallel investigations after the broadcast. Mm -hmm. That was May 25th, 1980. Like I said, it was like a bomb went off. And I wanted to continue trying to get more information about the non-humans that by then, after nine months of production and talking with people who had seen um, some kind of craft in a pasture where there was a mutilation or uh, being able to do hypnosis with an abductee named Linda Porter and being helped by uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle from the University of Wyoming in doing the hypnosis, she and her daughter, Cindy, they uh, were eyewitnesses. They were the first eyewitnesses, if you want to put it that way, of driving with their family from Houston, Texas in May of 1973. I, I am at the station and do not start work on a strange harvest till September of 1979. It's during that that I learn about this case going back six years and am able to get in touch with her and then arrange the hypnosis with Dr. Leo Sprinkle. And it was the cameraman running camera. I was running audio. Dr. Sprinkle was across the table here and Linda Porter was here. And as the hypnosis went deeper and deeper, and we are all listening, not knowing what's coming. When Dr. Sprinkle asked her, after they've gone up a beam in a beam of light, where are you? She's describing a round room. And he says, quietly, is there anybody there with you? And there was this silence. And then I see two little men. At this moment, on August 20th of 2021, these decades later, I can still feel the same tingling on my skin sitting there in a quiet room with a woman under hypnosis describing being taken in the same beam of light that she and her daughter watched a calf be lifted up out of the pasture, which is why she stopped the car. What is happening here? What is this beam of light? What, why is this calf going up in the beam of light? And then she and her daughter are going up in the beam. And she drew and made a sketch of the head that is shaped like this, that would be on the head of what today we would call something in the gray skin category, because we know a great deal more about reptilians and Nordics and a whole huge number. But her drawing is a classic because she was very uh, observant of details, very smart. And her sketch, uh, Dr. Sprinkle and I both felt that that day in that hypnosis session, it was as if we had walked into a dimension where we were being shown and told the truth. When you step out of the hypnosis session, when you come out of the film, when you come out into the planet that we live on, Judy Doherty and her daughter honest people who described and were in the documentary, they got to a point 
where they didn't even want to go places because they didn't want people saying you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And that same disconnect, that same uh, knee jerk reaction is part of the problem today, also in 2021. But what has happened, I think, over the last, if it's been 42 or 43 years, I became personally extremely concerned that people understand I am a TV producer. I'm a writer, director, editor. I have been so since doing two years on a master's degree at Stanford where I made documentaries. All of my news work after at KNBC in Los Angeles, WCBB in Boston, then being in management as director of special projects at the CBS station. Everything that I was committed to producing was in science, environment, and medicine. The irony was that trying to get to the bottom of a mystery that involved so much physical evidence, bodies, tissue, hemoglobin studies, uh, all kinds of lab reports that if you got them, you would find that pathologists in other states, other provinces were saying, excision appears to have been caused by electrosurgical technology, high heat, and the high heat evidence is in both my first book, An Alien Harvest, and the second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses. And Dr. Outschuler contributed some of the highest end examinations in which I would go out, I probably did about 30 different going into pastures by myself with formalin, scissors or a scalpel, cutting from the excisions, uh, making sure that they had wired labels. This is Linda's cut, here's the sheriff's cut, here's the mutilator's excision. Dr. Outschuler getting uh, the tissues done in thin preparations for slides and then studying the slides as he did on all of the human work that he did and coming to the conclusion that the heat was high and here were the pathology changes. Here's normal, here is what is going on in mutilated animals. And that for me was the definitive step and I felt proof that the rest of the world should accept. This is not predators, disease or satanic cult, that the ranchers, and the reporters who had seen the lights, who had uh, been involved with the time-lapse photos in Northern uh, Colorado with every other state in the United States, every province of Canada, having reported bloodless, trackless animal mutilations since at least the beginning of the 1960s. But there was a mantra and the mantra they still try to get away with today started with the CIA and the NSA and the DIA, because I talked with sheriffs who said people from Washington came to them and said, this is your answer to the media. It's predators, disease, or satanic cults. Our government today is still trying hard to control like drip by drip as we are at a point with that 180 day countdown in 2021, having to do with Congress, asking the director of national intelligence to collaborate with the secretary of state and tell us more information about unidentified aerial phenomena and UFOs, because why? They are now choosing to go through Navy, uh, infrared or radar films. This is the way that they have introduced the concept that we are dealing with other intelligences, but they still are not saying that. That there are unexplained aerial phenomena interacting on this planet since at least uh, the uh, 
2000s because military video taken from airplanes are in the category of unexplained aerial phenomena. And it is like word semantic games. UAPs of the 21st century are the UFOs of the 20th century and the 19th century going back 5,000, 10,000 years. There are all kinds of carvings and there have been paintings in other centuries that are the same round oval craft with beams coming out. You, you can do a search on uh, medieval paintings that show UFOs and you'll see hundreds. Well, so now we're in this ironic time that is like it's, it's opened the tiniest little sliver while there is this huge ocean of animal mutilations, human abductions, physical craft landings, scientific lab back engineering, and government policies of denial that have been leaked to me and to others, where they were officially in the 1940s and the 50s, it was under no circumstances is any of this information to be transferred to the media or to the public. And here are the penalties, and this is what will happen in military people who have told me that they were told they would lose everything. They would lose pensions, their family would lose everything. They were threatened threatened over and over again when they had interactions with what our government knew were extraterrestrial biological entities, non-homo sapien, sapien, and that the craft technology is what our government and China and Russia and other countries, Brazil, when they have had a chance to retrieve from within their boundaries, they have retrieved whether beings were alive or dead, but the crap because they have wanted to back engineer the technology. So right now we're on this very, very difficult landscape. In the military whistleblowers that I have talked to since 2018, all of them, Linda, there's not much more time this world needs to be told the truth because everything is not cool. There are friendlies and without them, the surface of earth might've been completely different. There are a lot of neutrals, more neutrals than friendlies. And then there are hostiles. And I think the biggest revelation that I've had the last year the hostiles, it isn't so much that they're hostile to homo sapiens as they want the beautiful laboratory earth to use as their laboratory. And they're fighting among each other over who can take earth. And that is where the military component, the threat why would Luis Elizondo, working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, encounter intelligence? Why in 2007, when he got money through Senator Harry Reid from Nevada, in collaboration about there being UFOs and extraterrestrial biological entities, that's where Harry Reid was coming from, you need to be able to study this and I will get you money. And, the, and Lou Elizondo, working counter intel for the Defense Intelligence Agency, names his new office in the Pentagon with thanks to uh, Senator Harry Reid, he names it Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program known now because of the New York Times and political coverage as ATIP. That was the acronym, ATIP. Why did Luis Elizondo 
DIA counter intel. Why did he put the word threat in the name of his office? I'm going to offer a possible explanation. It's not from him. It's in this year in which I've been being exposed by more and more military people to what is going on behind the scenes, even if they can't speak publicly. And what I'm beginning to see as a big, big, bigger picture, I have been told by three different people, one is a scientist since 2014, It would boil down to this as a metaphor. Earth is like a hotel. Humans didn't understand this, but it's been a hotel for probably 270 million years, at least. And just like hotels, different floors have different occupants. If you think of the Earth as an 8,000 mile diameter, planet, circumference of 25,000 miles, humans, going back to the transfer between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens sapien, which I think most will agree that there was a cross fade that was completed 45,000 years ago. Why was Neanderthalensis taken out? Why was there a surviving singular humanoid? Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, that is the current human population. And what really happened with the genetic manipulation that caused this Neanderthalensis? They had a bigger brain cubic brain capacity than Homo sapiens sapien archeologists and anthropologists who have studied where Neanderthalensis lived, they find that there were rectangular patches with flowers and plants that indicated because there were skeletons that the Neanderthalensis put flowers on the graves of their dead. That means that they had some other sense of a passing into something beyond and they were, uh, they were given the flowers the way I assume we would be in recognition and love probably. And that means that Neanderthalensis would be in the category of an intelligent humanoid. Homo sapiens sapien replaces those guests on the surface of the Earth Hotel. And humanity is a life form with others that is on the surface of the Earth Hotel. But a DIA analyst told me in December 1999, after 23 years that he worked before he retired, he said, there are three competing extraterrestrial civilizations, Linda, and our government has proof it was a quote, I've never forgotten. Our government has proof. The three have been competing in conflict with each other for at least 270 million years. And when I said, what is the proof? He sort of stopped and said, if I told you it would be dangerous for both of us. That concept led to him telling me he said, but I can share with you that of the three, there are the blonde Nordics, that's one group. There are the reptilian humanoids, that's another group. And they think they own earth because they have been in this hotel for the longest. And then there is a group of grays, gray skinned, gray in color, different shaped heads, usually large lens eyes, that are black, but it was interesting. He, all the way back 
to that December 1999 meeting, he was the first time that I encountered the concept that the grays were some organic, but mostly artificial intelligence, raising the question, who are their progenitors? And what does it mean that something would be competing with organic reptilians, organic Nordics, and be largely AI? What does that mean? And do any of us fully understand the implications of that at this time? And that the tall, thin grays that a few people have interacted with and tried to sketch and talked about as opposed to the three to four foot, which is the most common. The tall ones is, are my understanding, they are organic. They are an organic intelligence. Are they the progenitors of the menagerie of grays? I don't know. But nevertheless, a hotel earth, humans living on the surface with other life, but at least these three civilizations competing with each other have different parts of earth that they have been occupying for 270 million years. And the way he broke it down, he said, the reptilians like heat and they chose the Mesopotamian region of the Middle East and they have had big bases underneath the sands there. He said the Nordic humanoids, they like it cooler. And they have found that the best place for them on earth is to go down below the basins of the oceans and the seas, not at the bottom, go down to the bottom. Even if you were seven, uh, eight miles down in the Mariana Trench, you're going through water, you get to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, and then you have technology that takes you through into huge caverns that we have only been getting reports about from geophysicists in the last year or two about the discoveries of these huge spaces inside of our planet that no one knew existed before. And I have somebody talking to me about them in 1999. And that the, so the Nordics are in these big caverns beneath the oceans, and it's been perfect protection. It is extremely smart on any planet in the universe. If you are coming from the outside and you want to occupy, study, harvest from a planet, and if you have the host civilization is on the surface, well, going there first, that would be automatic, probably problem. So it, all of a sudden, it makes sense about all of these strategies of advanced intelligences for at least 270 million years, and their jobs are to go to different planets, and they're looking for laboratories, and they're looking for gold. They like min minerals and metals just like we do, and they have all these different reasons for what they do in what timeline and where they base, and I am convinced Earth is more like a hotel with the reptilians under the deserts, the blonde Nordics beneath the basins of the oceans and the seas, and the grays, the DIA analyst told me in 1999, he said they like to live inside of Earth mountains. And some of their favorite places are the Himalayas, and he went named other mountains. So once you begin to think about UFO, UAP, extraterrestrial biological entities in this new landscape. It isn't confined to Earth. It's my understanding in August of 2021 that our fellow power broker humans they already are involved with interstellar trade and moving point to point to 22 different planetary systems. Some are within 10 light years. Some are within 20 light years. Beyond, I don't know as much about. And it's all beginning to make so much more sense 
the idea that there could be 5,000 UFO reports in a year or whatever they were, that used to be an argument. It can't be anything from outer space because they could never be making 5,000 flights. If they are on the same planet with you in different places, like a hotel, but they're just traveling. And when they want to go back to their home planet, they kick in something like the Alcubier warp drive, which is patented now. This is not sci-fi. This is patented through the Navy. You can move point to point. You don't move a craft through space time. Your craft stays still. You pull space time to where you are. That's the Alcubier warp drive. And I think that what you would summarize as what, what does all of this add up to now as we are speaking on August 20th of 2021, that there are two completely different human civilizations. There's the one that is most, most of the billions of humans on earth now on the surface being ravaged by climate change and all kinds of devastations. And then there are others who are already out in parts of the Milky Way galaxy and they are already claiming the asteroid belt. It's my understanding the trillions of dollars in the metals, the rare metals and gold that is in the asteroid belt has already been divvied up. I just don't think it's fair. I think we are an abused species by the variety of non-humans that have used this earth as a laboratory. I accept that we humans are, the sentence is, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapiens sapiens. That was in the document that I was shown here at Kirtland Air Force Base on April 9th, 1983, when I was just beginning the what was to be the hour documentary for Home Box Office in New York. I had signed the contract. We were going to call it UFOs, the ET factor. And Peter Gersten, the attorney who used uh, for the first time Freedom of Information Act in the end of the 70s to file on all of the intel agencies, all of the military branches, other uh, agencies of government. He, he filed the first Freedom of Information Act request, Peter Gerson. He got back, of course, nothing, but he ended up taking the case to the Supreme Court. And that is the famous background as Stanton Friedman used to show all these pages all blacked out. This is our government's responses about UFOs and ETs. Peter Gersten got into an in-camera private chamber discussion in his Supreme Court presentation about uh, FOIA, the government should be telling the truth about what they know about UFOs and ETs like we've just gone through on the 180 day countdown. But instead, in camera, separate from the public, what the agencies gave were all of these blacked out pages. Blacked out pages a dozen, two dozen, three dozen, it doesn't matter. Blacked out pages says the government won't comment on the subject that you are inquiring about as an attorney on behalf of citizens who want UFO knowledge. Your putting black pages as an answer is essentially culpability. Yeah, we know a lot, but we can't share it. So right now, at this strange moment on earth, where I think every person 
feels that everything is being shaken up. The timeline feels shaken up. We are in revolution. Revolution doesn't always have to be with guns and bullets. We are in a major revolution about everything that we thought in 2019 was the civilization that we all shared. Between 2019, the pandemic, and now the end of 2021, we are in full bore revolution. And in an ironic way, the horrible scenes of the airport in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. in Kabul, it is rubbing in our faces if we will see it. It isn't just Afghanistan. It's everything. We're going to be going now through revolution after revolution after revolution. And the big box, I guess that's what I would like to make sure that your audience understands. The big box around everything that is happening is the fact that we already have part of the human civilization working with extraterrestrial biological entities in other solar systems within 10 and 20 light years. You can take that to the bank. No, I'm not expecting anybody in the government to say Linda is right. I'm telling you that I know this as fact from people who are working in those programs. And you know why they want to talk to me? This has been very interesting to me as an investigative reporter and a longtime TV producer. And I always have been, have had a life where I am just dealing with a hundred subjects every month and having to produce, understand and produce. And when you are with somebody that they, their life could be in jeopardy if you talk if you in any way hint who they are, where they live, what they do, what their title, no, you can't do that. And you have to accept from me that I am talking from firsthand discussions. But what these guys, because I've never had a woman ever, and isn't that also consistent with the revolution we're in? There are no women in these programs that are involved with interstellar uh, galactic travel from everything I know. It's always men. But their reason for reaching out to me, and I wouldn't have communication if they didn't reach out to me. I have no way of knowing about anybody who is working in any of these programs. They have to come to me. And they always say, they always say the same thing. I don't know, maybe it's a program mantra within the agencies. Linda, I still believe in the constitution. Those are the words that I always hear. And even though that sounds simple, I get it. I, as a journalist, am supposed to be protected by the First Amendment. And yet we are on a planet now in 2021. How many journalists have been murdered this year, last year, and the year before, including the horror of the cut up body of Khashoggi? And so in an odd way, when I hear those words, I still believe in the Constitution. To me, what is being translated, that there are so many people who are working intel and military, and they are twisted. They are, they are agonized within themselves that they thought they were working for a democracy which is what, where those words mean. I still believe in the constitution. But they know it no longer applies. The United States has not been a democracy for 
who knows how long. It is under elite strategic control of a tiny, tiny group of people who can have SAP clearances, special access programs. If you put a hundred different, let's say interstellar trade, uh, going down deep into the earth, whatever it is, if you put those taxpayer dollar projects in a special access program, no one, no one has access. Not the president of the United States, not the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. How that came about over the decades since World War II, because the evolution into all of this high-end secrecy has been um, accelerated from World War II when the allies of the United States and England and Canada and New Zealand and Australia working together bonded against what Germany and, and Hitler were trying to do. They were photographing. They were discussing. They had secret documents then in World War II, starting out calling them Foo Fighters. And then Kenneth Arnold contributed the phrase uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Enormous amounts of information was generated in World War II and also generated hand in hand was the Psalm 101 uh, training manual, extraterrestrial biological entities and technologies. That's the title. And it has been proved this was printed in a 1954 printing press out here at Kirtland, classified printing press, the Psalm 101 Majestic 12 Extraterrestrial Biological Entities and Technologies. Bob Wood, PhD, aerospace engineer, worked for McDonnell Douglas for three or four decades. And it was after he retired that he took on the challenge of proving or disproving the Psalm 101 document has said in strong words in conferences and on television, the Psalm 101 is a legitimate document. It is probably the best whistleblower release of all time. And he said, and I was able to track down the manager of the classified press at Kerlin Air Force Base in 1954, the date on Psalm 101 is April 1954, who confirmed he knew and recognized the title, recognized the training manual. He had overseen it being printed and showed Dr. Wood that there were little things that printers only could tie one print, one press in 1954 to what was leaked to us. And the bottom line in that was no one outside of Majestic 12 is ever to know anything. Where and how did that happen? Within the decade of the end of World War II. So when these men Look at my eyes and they say, I believe in the Constitution. That's what they're saying. Everything is truly warped. We're in an upside down, bass, backwards nation. All because the Allies decided that no one should know about extraterrestrial biological entities and that UFOs were real. Now you can jump over also to a different perspective that I think is what I'm trying to understand now. Jump over to the other intelligences and try to imagine not being human and interacting with earth and as Haim Eshed in Israel said, 
uh, at the end of, in December of 2020. Everybody was asking him about his book and the epilogue that he called We're Not Alone, that there are other intelligences. And he, he was the head of the Israeli satellite program. If anybody on the planet would know about UFOs and ETs as extraterrestrials, it would be Haim Eshet, PhD in Israel. And everybody's asking him, well, if this is true, if there are extraterrestrials, why why are we waiting for the announcement? And he said, the timeline is not ours, it's theirs. And when I first heard that, I thought uh, he's being flip. It's just a flip answer. But the more I and a few others, because I've read the entire epilogue that he wrote, which is implying UFOs and ETs on Earth all over the place, that he could be absolutely telling the truth because there are all kinds of rumors, some in between things implied in documents, a very few possible testimonies in deathbed having to do with our government through Dwight D. Eisenhower, having made treaties, one or more, with extraterrestrial biological entities, without saying, was it grays, was it blondes, was it reptilians? Who did we make one or more treaties with and about what? If General Eisenhower went from World War II in the battlefield and he and Winston Churchill, and this, this is part of the story, literally sat together and talked about the extraterrestrial biological entities and their machines in the skies that they knew were real. And they knew that behind Adolf Hitler were his own statements that he was going to claim earth for the blonde, blue-eyed, Aldebaran extraterrestrials who were guiding him and teaching him how to have his scientists make the Vril machines, V-R-I-L, underground at Pienamunde, a peninsula at the far northeastern corner of Germany. And it might have been that Eisenhower and Churchill looking at the whole huge scene. My God, we're not alone in this universe. We're in a world of war because one of the leaders, Germany's leader, wants to go in allyship with blonde ETs and take over the world. We can't allow that. How are we going to stop this? And allegedly, the science son of a man who was overhearing this discussion between uh, Prime Minister Churchill and Eisenhower that allegedly took place somewhere around 43 or 44. The war ended in 45 with us dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes. So if within a year or two, of the dropping of the bombs, if this discussion between Winston Churchill and General Eisenhower took place as described, then the words that became global policy were Winston Churchill. We cannot, we cannot allow this for at least 50 years. The stock markets will fall, religions will crumble, and we will lose civilization. That is allegedly the summary of what he said to General Eisenhower. And within a short period of time after that discussion in London, the end of the war, General Eisenhower becomes president of the United States. 
I think he was the last president who knew everything. Truman knew everything. FDR knew a lot because he was talking with Truman. And then Truman became president and he set up MJ-12. So Truman was, we'll call, had universal knowledge of what, what they had then. And that was passed to Eisenhower. So Eisenhower is the one that they say made some kind of treaty or treaties with extraterrestrial biological entities. And if that is why Haim Eshed in Israel in December of 2020 said in reply about his book and the epilogue titled, We Are Not Alone, and all of his references to UFO cases and structures on Mars, it is not our timetable, it is theirs. And that, if that is true, what are the non-humans waiting for? And that's the question that haunts me right now, because this planet is in revolution. And where this revolution is headed is a complete, at least an unknown to those of us who are not in SAP programs or out 10 light years away in an interstellar program. They may know everything. And it may be why there is this pressure for, uh, I'm gonna say pressure that has come through both Elon Musk's own statements, as well as people around him. And probably the strongest is Elon Musk said, what, four months ago? It's in newspapers. My goal is to have 1 million humans from Earth in the underground lava tube bases on Mars by 2050. Yeah. Why? Why would he make that announcement this year? And you, I mean, I don't think I have to underscore. Everything I've been telling you are lived pieces of my life from 79, starting with what in the world is happening with all these bloodless, trackless animal mutilation, having law enforcement telling me they are extraterrestrial biological entities, abductees say it's reptiles, not the Nordics or the greys, but who knows for sure. But nevertheless, the ETs harvest blood, fluid, and tissue from Earth life. What are they making with it? Now you have all of these books and statements coming about the hybrids. Okay, so we have hybrids that are part human and part other. And I assume that then the harvest of tissue and genetic material from the surface life of Earth has been going on for the 270 million years that the DIA guy told me in December 1999, plenty of time to experiment with mixing and matching genes and continually coming up with something, whatever it is, is your goal and doing it so that the surface life of what you are experimenting with never understands the big picture Where is 2021 on their timeline? And if human power brokers are still scared to death to open up the truth, and they know the truth, it seems to me that everybody is sending the same message. And it goes back to the control remote viewers that worked for the CIA and DIA when they said, all of us in remote viewing, when we were tasked and later on they would talk, they were all tasked, is there other consciousness in the universe? 
and all the trained control remote viewers working for the CIA, NSA, and DIA in the 1980s at Fort Meade next door to the NSA building, they all got this universe is, and these are their words, teeming with consciousness. And Lynn Buchanan, who I interviewed, it's at earthfiles.com and it's at my Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast. This was an interview that I did probably five years ago. Lynn Buchanan was one of those control remote viewers uh, working with the Project Stargate at the NSA facility uh, off grounds. The NSA and CIA wouldn't let the remote viewers be in any formal parts because they didn't want to be embarrassed in case there was a backlash against control remote viewing. So the poor remote viewers had to work uh, like they were uh, pawns in a chess game uh, operating uh, as something else while they were doing these important remote viewings. And not only did they all get the universe is teeming with consciousness, but Lynn said, we also all got this. There are friendlies, there are neutrals, and there are hostiles. And our government is most worried about the hostiles. My answer then, and it is now, yes, we may be, have concern about hostiles, but isn't that even more reason to introduce the friendlies and the neutrals to Earth and lay out the whole story and say, we are now going to be able to work in collaboration with other life in this universe who actually care about us, who will protect us with their superior technology while we are being trained to evolve with them. Why couldn't that have been done 50 years ago? It might have changed a million things of violence on this earth. The only answer that's ever been given to me when I posed exactly as I just did to you, to, to some of the whistleblowers. Remember, we're dealing with a male point of view across the board. And the answer has always been, Linda, humans cannot give up their power of Earth. I think that is the most misdirected, misguided possible point of view. If in World War II, the human male population had told the entire earth the truth that they were learning, whatever it was about Hitler, whatever it was about the ETs on the moon, they knew that about ETs having bases throughout our solar system. But it doesn't have to be in fear. It could have been then. We've got this war on Earth, but we have discovered that we have allies in this universe and they are willing to help us. And we are now going to move into a different age. And then the men now will say, but Linda, we would have no ability to have a reality check on what the ones who say they're friendly, could they be fooling us? So all of a sudden you begin to see that the power brokers are forever, everything is second guessed as being negative, second guessed as if we lose our power, we lose everything. But isn't the irony of that statement that if there are a million civilizations between the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda, and there's supposed to be three trillion galaxies with millions and millions of stars, the idea 
that any human, male or otherwise, would be holding power because they were in communication with other intelligences they wanted no other humans to know about, that in the scope of things were identified as friendly, and, and they are assuming that they must have a secret arrangement with those friendlies in order to control and sustain their power. What is the illusion of power to humans who would make that kind of argument? No, it, it, if, if, the, if the blondes or whoever it is that's in the friendly category are moving point to point through the universe faster than the speed of light, which is the definition, I'm sorry, but they are the ones who have the superior technology, not evolving, struggling humans in World War II. And so it's like smoke and mirrors. Let's cast all of Earth like in a Walt Disney scene. Nobody's ever to know the truth. These are the rules. We have to get through the generations that knew the 20th century. And meanwhile, Elon Musk will get a million people to Mars, and then that will paper over everything. Humanity will be out in the solar system in outer space. By then, they will probably have announced, oh, we've been able to establish contact at Procyon A and B, and uh, we can start doing trade with them without saying we've been doing trade with Procyon A and B for decades looking for ways to paper over everything as it really was to concoct a space age with non-humans who I've been told can be friendly. Why can't we today be introduced to the friendly? There you have. <laughs> wow, Linda, this is a lot um, to unpack. I hear you. I, you've got so many good points. I mean, it's unbelievable what's going on right now. And yeah, yeah there's going to be a lot of explaining to do. So I guess they'll just paper over it and we'll all be living in a tube on Mars here one of these days or something. I don't know. Unbelievable. And Brian, you know, another thing that's puzzling to leave on a question uh, because my uh, video tech editor is going to be here in about 25 minutes for the thing I have to do. Uh, it's a Zoom thing with uh, people on, it's called Making Contact Convergence we're doing yes. today. Um, is I guess if you look back, to 10,000 years ago of what we have in archaeology. And we've got the symbols in the Sanskrit from Sumeria and from the Anunnaki. And they are accepted as ancient civilizations on Earth. But everything I know, they are related to progenitors that are still out in the far reaches that we're mixing and matching genes. So it's like you, you go to the, the past, you come around to the present, the past is out here in space, and that eventually it's all got to come together in one huge, oh my God, the Greeks were, full blood, uh, blonde humanoids based on this planet. That's why they were so smart. And on and on. And that unpacking all of this is just like a huge ball of yarn that has a thousand colors in it. 
but I cannot imagine being alive on this planet at a more exciting time with the potential. If we move to truth and not creating a, a false theatrical surface. And that's why I do the work I do. And that's why we're talking today. We all want to thank you for the work that you do and for seeking the truth and just going after it. And I think you spoke about the reason why all these people have confided you in you over the years. And I think it speaks to your journalistic integrity. They know that you have their back. You're going to keep their confidences and you've been willing to go to the places that a lot of people would fear to tread and bring this to everyone. And we're so grateful to you, Linda. We cannot thank you enough. And everybody, you've got to go check out earthfiles.com. Subscribe there. It's the best on the internet. And check out Linda's um, YouTube channel. We will have all the links. Linda, Wednesday you're night. amazing. Wednesday nights. And Wednesday we broke through 182,000 subscribers. Uh, I got the notice today. Yes, congratulations. Well deserved. And there's another 500,000, I'm sure, on their way to you as we prepare, I guess, for our journey into our little tubes on Mars or wherever we're going. You know, a lot of the reasons why we will be able to do this with open eyes is because of the work that you've done you. throughout your career to bring truth. And, and I'm grateful. And I know I've got a lot of um, people who agree with what I'm saying to you right now. Thank and you. I want to thank you because of your intelligence and your giving space for me to sort of do a jazz riff, <laughs> looking over four, uh, four and a half decades. But it is because of you giving me that space that I can try to give what I gave back and, and that we have been on a planet up until just recently where nobody felt that they could give anyone time to talk about this vastly important subject. So thank you. Thank you. Sending you tons of love, blessings, continued success on your path. Linda Moulton Howe, friends, one of the true heroes of the modern time. Thank you so much for being on Healing Arts. I love you and I love humans and I think we deserve to have a future. I love you, Linda. You are one of my all-time favorites. It's been a complete honor and a joy. And like I said, we all thank you. You have no idea um, the impact you're making that you've made. It's going to change a lot of lives. It's continuing to change our lives. And we're just so grateful. I hope so in the most positive way. And may you be protected always. Thank you. Likewise, you as well. Send me the link wherever. Oh, I'm going to send you. Yes, definitely. Right. Definitely. Okay. And wish me luck on the next round that I go through. Yes. The busiest lit, uh, lady in showbiz. She's got oh. another one. And we have loved seeing you on Ancient Aliens, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, all the places that you are, and especially on earthfiles.com. Wonderful. Yeah. I've been you. doing it since 1999. Absolutely. It has uh, about 3,000 in-depth science environment and real x-files reports and somebody told me the other day you, they said you have more information in your real x-files at earth files than anybody has ever put out in a book and i think that's probably true uh, sure. at least in terms of the 20 years with doing all of the reports on everything animal mutilations human abductions government cover-up uh military deceit on and on and on it's it, it, I use the real X files in my own research. <laughs> yes. And you, you do, you have the most extensive catalog of anything, anything you need to know. Linda is the person you are the go-to. Well, thank you. Let's do it again. Absolutely. After we get another announcement from somebody about the yes. truth. Then Hopefully it'll be, should do this be, again. Yeah. Beyond a nine pager. That's a little bit insulting to someone who spent her whole career doing what you're doing, but Hey, you know, we'll hope for better, maybe 18 or 20 next time. All, you right. Know? All right. I'm going right. to go Linda. off, but I, I love you and the work you're doing and my best to everyone. Thank you. You as well. The phenomenal Linda Moulton. Howe, everybody.